<laughs> the rest of our service will be led by our very own Maureen Russell. So I invite her to come up now. I was just telling Kathy, she's such a good teacher. It's like I can imagine being in her classroom and I, I would obey everything she said. <laughs> You know, it's time right now to sit back in your chair, plant your feet on the supportive ground under you, and witness the gentle energy of the breath, the light you can take in, which links you to the planet and all its inhabitants. Here's a poem by Marge Piercy, entitled Seven of Pentacles. Under a sky the color of pea soup, she is looking at her work growing away there, actively, thickly like grapevines or pole beans, as things grow in the real world, slowly enough. If you tend them properly, if you mulch, if you water, if you provide birds that eat insects a home and winter food, if the sun shines and you pick off caterpillars, if the praying mantis comes and the ladybugs and the bees, then the plants flourish, but at their own internal clock. Connections are made slowly. Sometimes they grow underground. You cannot always tell by looking what is happening. More than half the tree is spread out in the soil under your feet. Penetrate quietly as the earthworm that blows no trumpet. Fight persistently as the creeper that brings down the tree. Spread like the squash plant that overruns the garden. Gnaw in the dark and use the sun to make sugar. Weave real connections. Create real nodes. Build real houses. Live a life you can endure. Make love that is loving. Keep tangling and interweaving and taking more in. A thicket a bramble wilderness to the outside, but to us, interconnected with rabbit runs and barrows and layers. Live as if you liked yourself, and it may happen. <laughs> Reach out, keep reaching out, keep bringing in. This is how we are going to live for a long time, not always. For every gardener knows that after the digging, after the planting, after the long season of tending and growth, the harvest comes. May this be so.
You know, it's a great day to talk about this um, topic of interdependency. Um, you know, so much of the time we like to think of ourselves as in independent, strong, um, not really needing anybody or anything, right? I mean, at least that's how I like to live my life um, till I came here and then I realized, wow, there's more to it than that. <laughs> um, but anyway, I wanted to talk about a different kind of interdependence that maybe doesn't include well, the social aspect of interdependence, like we like to talk about, you know, with the seven principle. And so what I'd like to discuss today is more about the mystery of nature's interdependence. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, especially with this crowd, you're all tuned in, you watch, I'm sure, a lot of, uh, you know, nature type of programs, your readers, um, your hardy naturalists. So if I say some things, and I'm talking about some, some ideas that you know already, just um, bear with me. It may not be a big surprise. You may have heard that researchers have discovered an extensive underground network connecting plants by their roots, serving as a complex interplant communication system, kind of like a plant internet, right? Anybody ever hear? It's going around. Suzanne Simard, a forest ecologist at the University of British Columbia, and her colleagues have made this major discovery that trees and plants really do communicate and interact with each other. She discovered an underground web of fungi, fungi, <laughs> connecting the trees and plants of the ecosystem. This enables the purposeful sharing of resources, helping the whole system of trees and plants to flourish. You know, things like carbon, right. nutrients. Samard was led to the discovery by the observation of webs. You're digging around in this forest soil, right? How many people have done that, right? You're like, dig in. And um, she sees these webs of bright yellow and white fungal threads in the forest floor. Many of those fungi turned out to be mycorrhizal, which means that they have beneficial symbiotic relationship uh, with a host plant, in this case, the tree roots. Microscopic experimentation by her team revealed that the fungi do move this carbon, water, and nutrients between trees depending upon their needs, depending upon the needs of the trees around them. So they're talking to each other, chemically. At the hub of a forest's mycorrhizal network stands the mother trees. That's what she calls them, the mother trees. So um, they're large, older trees. They rise above the forest, kind of like, you know, what you saw in Avatar. Right. These mother trees are connected to all the other trees in the forest by this network of fungal threads and may manage the resources of the whole plant community. Simmons' latest research reveals that when a mother tree is cut down, the survival rate of the younger me members of the forests are diminished. <coughs> the big tree subsidizes the young ones through the fungal networks. Without this helping hand, most of the seedlings wouldn't make it. Who knew? <coughs> We're always thinking about Darwinian competition, right? You know, I'm going to get big and strong and crowd out. I'm gonna like shade you guys so you can't come up. Well, this is really different stuff, right? Mother Nature is no stranger to the UU Seventh Principle, which is about the sacred and holy interconnectedness of all life forms on the planet. In fact, she invented it. Many spiritual scholars throughout the ages have referred to her innate ecological wisdom. For example, Thomas Martin, the Trappist monk taught that compassion, you know, something we hold dear in this beautiful place, is the keen awareness of the interdependence of all things. And who hasn't heard Chief Seattle's proclamation? This we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to earth. All things are connected, like the blood which connects one family. Whatever befalls the earth, befalls the children of the earth. 
Man does not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. And we can interject himself, herself, you know, you know the drill. <laughs> Check this out. There's this guy I once saw at the Unitarian Church in Rochester, and actually that was the first time I'd ever been to a Unitarian Church, and it was back, I don't know, mid-80s. But there was a guy, um, his name was Thich Nhat Hanh, and he gave, um, he gave a talk there. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just remember sitting in this space, and, and I was like, wow, this, this, is, this is feeling kind of peaceful. Mm-hmm. Anyway, here's what he said. If you were a poet, you will see, clearly see that there is a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Without a cloud, there will be no rain. Without rain, the trees cannot grow. And without trees, we cannot make paper. The cloud is essential for the paper to exist. If the cloud is not here, the sheet of paper cannot be here either. So we can say that the cloud and the paper inter are. Now he didn't say it with the Jersey accent. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> but let's examine some more biology right now. After all, science is only a few steps behind the spiritual know-how of interdependence and cooperation. I mean, how about gut bacteria? All right, let's, let, let, let's get down and dirty here. There's a growing body of evidence linking widespread health issues, ranging from obesity and diabetes to rheumatoid arthritis, irritable bowel syndrome, and depression, to the presence of various microbes in our gut. Wegmans has a handle on it because he's got a whole refrigerator full of probiotics that you, know, you, could, you could down if you feel like it. One reason scientists find research into the microbiome so intriguing is because studies are turning up so many connections to our overall health. Some of the best understood issues pertain to our digestive systems. But research also suggests that this is just a starting place. Our gut bacteria have a much wider influence on us, on our physical and mental health even. For one thing, gut bacteria are tied into our immune systems with all sorts of obvious and less obvious connections. One area of study is investigating possible links between gut bacteria and autoimmune disease. For example, there's a connection possibly between one particular type of gut bacteria and rheumatoid arthritis. Gut microbes also appear to have a role in the low level inflammation associated with diabetes and obesity. And evidence also shows a potential brain-gut connection. New research, albeit on mice, has found connections between microbes and mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, and autism. Who knew that these teeny tiny little bacteria might even impact our personalities? (laughs) OMG. Now, more biology. There's this, this strange symbiosis between the sloths and moths. Hmm. Kathy, this poetry thing with Ferdinand, it's like, you know, <laughs> Mother Nature pulls out all the stops on this one. You gotta hear about it. There's this guy by the name of Joseph Bennington Castro, and he writes about sloths. You know, those cute but very slow moving creatures in the rainforest. Three claws. He says, once a week, three toad sloths slowly descend from the lethal a forest canopy to poop on the ground. They come all the way down to defecate. <clears throat> Why do these sluggish mammals go on such a long and potentially dangerous journey instead of just letting it fly from the treetops? <laughs> I would. <laughs> Scientists now believe the answer has to do with the odd symbiotic relationship between sloths and moths. Only about 10 mammalian species, less than 0.2% of all mammals have evolved to eat leaves and fruit that can only be found by climbing trees. Mostly that's because living high in the trees imposes certain lifestyle constraints. 
First, the animals must be small and light enough to live in that habitat. And second, must be able to digest a huge amount of plant matter, which is rich in fiber, but low in nutrients. Right? You see that big plate of salad, and you're like, oh, I'd rather have the ham. <laughs> Sloths are one of the few mammals that make this lifestyle work, and they come in two flavors. Two-toed sloths have a relatively large home range of up to 140 hectares and a comparative diverse diet of leaves, fruits, insects, small lizards, and carrion. By contrast, three-toed sloths have small home ranges, 0.3 to 15 hectares. By that, they dine exclusively on leaves from only a few select trees. So as a result of this nutritionally poor, toxic diet, three-toed sloths have the slowest rate of digestion for any mammal. And as you probably know from watching cute sloth videos, they have an incredibly slow metabolic rate that amounts to less than half of what's expected for their mass. The two sloth types also differ in their pooping habits. About once a week, a three-toed sloth will descend from the canopy, create a depression in the ground near the base of the tree with its tail, and defecate in the hull. It then covers the latrine with leaves and climbs back up. Two-toed sloths aren't so ritualistic. They often poop from the canopy more than once a week. Okay. But here's the thing. The scientists are wondering, why don't the three-toed sloths just let it go from the canopy like the two-toed sloths? Right? Because, you know, if you have it down there, now you're in the crosshairs of, of predators, right? So there's a risk there. And it uses a lot of calories, right, to do all that work. So some scientists wondered whether the sloths do it to fertilize their tree homes. Or maybe they're using these latrines to communicate with other sloths. But University of Wisconsin-Madison wildlife ecologist Jonathan Pollock and his colleagues believe the sloth's risky toilet quest is to help all the crawly denizens in the sloth's fur. You see, sloth's fur isn't just a bunch of hair. It's packed with, with green from algae, and it's loaded with sloth moths, among other things. When a sloth poops on the ground, the adult female moths leave the mammal to lay their eggs in the feces. The eggs eventually hatch, and the moth larvae feed on the poop. Then, as adults, they fly up into the canopy to nestle in the sloth's fur. But if the sloths are pooping on the ground to help the moths flourish, what do they get out of it? Do sloths and moths really have a symbiotic relationship? Or are the moths just mooching off the sloths? Polly and his team reason that the sloths must get some sort of nutritional benefit by becoming these roaming micro-ecosystems. Quote, we hypothesize that this behavior sustains an ecosystem in the fur of sloths, which confers unknown nutritional benefits to the sloths, they wrote. And maybe this added nutrition has something to do with the algal mat in their fur. So to test it, the researchers captured two-toed and three-toed sloths near San Jose, Costa Rica. They vacuumed all the moths off the sloths. Can you imagine? <laughs> Vacuum suck. And counted how many critters each sloth had. Man, I'd love that job. Then they cut off the locks of fur, analyzed the nitrogen and phosphorus content in the fur, and measured the amount of alga present. Finally, they used a long tube and syringe to suck up samples from the sloth's four stomachs, an organ where their food collects after being swallowed. Well, they found that the three-toed sloths harbored far more moths than the two-toed sloths, and as the number of moths increased, so did the amount of algae in their fur. Some of the sloths also had algae in their four stomachs. So, the belief is here that when the sloths help the moths thrive, the moths in turn help the algae grow either by directly transporting nutrients or when they die and decay. And here's where the sloths actually get something out of this swamp thing scenario. The animals eat the moth-fed algae in their fur to supplement their nutrient-poor diets. The algae is easy to digest, 
and contains as many carbs and proteins as leaves, but up to five times more fat. Right? Everybody needs some chocolate. <laughs> An unaccounted food source would help to explain why three toad sloths are difficult to keep well nourished in sanitized captive facilities. The algae would also have the added benefit of camouflaging the sloths from their natural predators in the canopy, such as the harpy eagle. My last example of Mother Nature's brilliant interdependent scheme is all about It's all about the giant cockroach. <laughs> Blabberus giganticus. Now, Juanita from Costa Rica. She just laid eggs, by the way. And uh, you know, this is this is a big this is a big insect, right? <laughs> Now, she lives in caves. She doesn't live under Nick da Tahoe's garbage plate. Continue. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, these things are really interesting because they have a special relationship with the genus Blatha bacterium. So it's called a host microbe relationship. The microbe's job is to take nitrogenous waste such as urea and ammonia, right, that she makes, and process it into amino acids that she can use. So it's very beneficial because the overall diet of this gal is plant-based and very nitrogen poor. So it's a win-win situation, right? Good for you, Juanita. I, I, you just want to just samba or something with this thing. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm going to um, pass her around if you'd like her to get a good look <laughs> and a good feel. <laughs> she kind of tickles. But um, anyway, I'll put the lid on. It's got holes in it. I used the drill this morning. And, uh, you know, you could look at, look at the critter. and she, She's really quite amazing. So, from biologists and ecologists, We've learned the scientific reality and truth that our incredible planet Earth is comprised of complex, interconnected, and interrelated ecosystems. Complex and really fragile systems of plant and animal life, which naturally fit together into patterns of mutual dependence and health that allow all to thrive together. We Unitarian Universalists are convinced that this must be at least as much of a spiritual awakening as it is a scientific one. By promising to respect the interdependent web of which we're a part, we're saying that humanity must cultivate and deepen our sense of kinship, wise and compassionate and caring kinship with this incredibly holy web of life into which we're so miraculously born. We must learn deep to the heart that we are bound up in a family of life and loving and living things that demands and deserve our care, our respect, our love, and our steady, trustworthy protection. So let us then each do our part. It's part of our organization here to build that kinship with the interdependent web of all existence. And from that place of wisdom and respect, do the hard work and sacrifice we must do to keep this mother planet, mother earth, mother nature, a beautiful and gentle and healthy home for humanity, and the incredibly beautiful web of life which sings around us. Amen. If you'll join us in the closing song, 175, we celebrate the web of life. <laughs>
Now, if you could help extinguish the chalice in the closing words, grab a hand. Everybody connected? <laughs> You're doing so well. <laughs> Some of us are independent, actually. <laughs> Codependency. <clears throat> we extinguish this flame, but not the light of the truth. The warmth of community and the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Join us for worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Canandaigua, a welcoming congregation. We are located at 3024 Cooley Road, four miles west of South Main Street, Canandaigua, just north of the intersection with routes 5 and 20. Look for the blue signs just before the turn. Your comments about this program or questions about the church are welcome at 585-396-1370 or at our website www.canandaiguauu.org. Producer and Editor Daniel Brigham